dinner. Oh, golly. It's always an honor to be here. Good afternoon. Oh, so, hey, um, this is how you know how much I love the Lord that, um, and I'm afraid of Skip, that, um, uh, so when he called me and said, could you come up in here and do this? Um, so yesterday in God's country, which is Atlanta, it was 77 degrees. Um, and today it's supposed to be 76, and tomorrow it's supposed to be 78, and we have blooms on trees. Now, um, trees have these things called blooms on them. <laughs> And then they have eventually leaves as well. Now, I know you people who are not in God's country, you don't know <laughs> these things. Um, I don't know what, there are these piles of dirty, dirty white things. I don't understand all that all over here either. So um, I, I want you to know, yeah, that it's lovely to be up here. And when you are ha having snow tomorrow, you will know once again that God does not like you. So. Um, <laughs> And think of me down in Atlanta, exactly, in God's country. So it's an, it's an honor to be with you. I'm delighted. Uh, precious commodity for the year 2014 and beyond. Precious commodity. What is it? That's it. People's time, right? Um, everyone wants to have more time. It's not bitcoins, and it's not uh, Facebook stock, uh, et cetera. It really is time. And so thank you for the gift of your time. And those of you who are watching us from other places, um, the chance to have some conversation about this topic of youth ministry and technology. So um, uh, as you heard uh, Skip tell you, I teach uh, about teaching and Christian education and youth and young adult ministry at Columbia Seminary there in Atlanta, Georgia. Um, my my um, tradition is Presbyterian. I'm a Presbyterian pastor. Um, but so my teaching and the uh, whole conversation about education, how people best learn, um, one of my beliefs is that knowledge is socially constructed, that the Holy Spirit is in the room, even at Yale Divinity School, and the possibility exists that the Holy Spirit can be teaching us by God's grace through um, the presence of Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit. Amen? Amen. Nicely done. So, uh, since knowledge is socially constructed and we need each other to know things, I want to have some conversation with you, and it really is supposed to be a conversation in this next 50 minutes or so. Um, youth ministry and technology is my topic area. Um, I uh, commend to you, uh, oh golly, if we can do, hey, Skip, can we do lights? Um, do I, right now, thank you. Um, I think it would be helpful. I want to commend to you um, this. This just aired. Double next time on Frontline. I like. I like. I like. The power of like. Companies know how to turn like into money. The kids who are like. <laughs> this is my first fight. I'm a cool rich food taco. And the advertising machine spinning likes into gold. Your consumer is your marketer. This is the biggest transformation that we've had in our lifetime. Inside Generation Like. Watch online or on air beginning February 18th. Anybody view uh, uh, Frontline Generation Like? Anybody have a chance to view that yet? Russ has, nicely done. It's online now and available to you. Citations at the bottom of, so uh, white pieces of paper are in front of you. It's a quiz, right? Um, same thing um, on front and back. So the first thing you're gonna do is I'm gonna test your knowledge of adolescence and technology. So at your tables, and it doesn't have to be the whole table, but maybe you cluster three or four people on a side. Your job is to run through this survey, numbers one through 13, and the citation is on the bottom. That's where you can find Generation Like. It's a 53-minute program. It's worthwhile. It's uh, required viewing for my students. I'm teaching right now a basic youth ministry class, and they had to view this last night, and they're now in the process of commenting on it online and responding to their comments back and forth. So um, this is data from Frontline. Your job as a table or a cluster of people around you is to answer number one through 13. For instance, number one says, what percent of American teens are mobile internet users? What does mobile internet users mean? Ah, nice, so they have access to a smartphone or whatever, they can carry around the internet with them as opposed to a desktop in the kitchen or in their bedroom, please no, but anyway, um, at home, okay? So you're trying to think what percent of American teens, this is all American, this is all USA data, so you agree on that number and you go one through 13, okay? About seven minutes to go through it, please, quickly.
such a good guess. Okay, just a couple minutes more, just about two minutes more, please. I know, sorry. Two minutes more. That's okay. Yeah, you, that's okay. Yeah, exactly. Very good. the real name. How low? Well, and it just, I wonder if it depends on what media 
Ooh, good point, good point, good point, good point. Yeah, 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 yeah. So this is what we yeah, whatever profile they use most often. Yeah. So probably. Well, so most often it's Instagram. Let's be real. So very low. Um, She's kind of authoritative. <laughs> I, I have the pen, so. But I'll do whatever she says too. She sort of puts it out there. Okay, let me call you back. I know we may, may not be done, sorry, but I'm watching time also because I want to value your time, so I have a conversation about this. Number one, what percent of American teenagers are mobile internet users? If you use 50% or less, raise your hand. 51 to 75? 76 or higher? Wow, really? It was 74%. Number two, percent of American teens have a personal smartphone. Uh, less than 50%, raise your hand. 51 to 75, 76 or higher, 37 percent. Number three, percent of American teens use the internet, sorry, us the internet, use the internet daily. 50 percent or less, raise your hand. 51 to 75, 76 or higher, it's 95 percent. Okay, this may not be a reason for celebration necessarily. <laughs> Four. Oh, good point. Thank you. It could be using it for school. That's true. In our perfect world, yes. So um, four, because <laughs> we love Jesus, four, four percent of teens have a computer or access to one at home. That's important. What percent, I'm asking? Fifty percent or less, raise your hand, at home, access to a computer. Fifty-one to seventy-five. Seventy-six or higher. Frontline says ninety-three percent. So, um, so conversations about the great digital divide are completely crashing at this point. You get that, right? Can you see it? Um, there, there are social economic issues at stake here, but those conversations are pretty much ending at this point. All right? Um, five, what percent of American teens save the laptop or desktop they use most often is, sorry, say, is one they share with other family members? They say that the desktop or laptop that they use most often is one they share with other family members. 25% um, or less. 26 to 50? Oh, golly, good. 51 to 75? 76 or higher? It's 71%. Number six, from one most used to five least used, rank the following social media sites for usage on any given day among these are adolescent numbers. So, um, what was number one? Number one is Facebook. Still, exactly, still, even though last year about 11 million teenagers vacated their Facebook accounts, Facebook still is number one, far and away. Um, last year about 17 million college students vacated their Facebook accounts. Um, but still, number one is Facebook. What's number, what's number five? Uh, Pinterest, very good, yeah. So number one is Facebook, two is Snapchat, Three is Instagram, four is Twitter, and five is Pinterest. Seven, what percent of American teens who regularly post photos of themselves, sorry, on social media? What percent? These, uh, what percent? Uh, 50, really? It was 91%. It was 79% in 2006. Eight. Percent of American teens who regularly post videos of themselves on social media. Videos versus photos. 24%. Number nine, percent of American teens who post their full real name to the profile they use most often. 50% or less. 51 to 75. 76 or higher. How high? What did you, 90? How high? 80? How high? 80, sister? What? 78? It was 92%. 10, percent of American teens who post their real birthday on the profile they use most often. 82%. 
11% of American teen Facebook users who set their profiles to private. What percent? 50% or less? 51 to 75. 76 or higher? It's 60%. 12% of American teen Facebook users who post their real email address. 53%, just over half. 53, post their real email address. And 56% of American teen Facebook users say it is not difficult at all to manage the privacy controls on their Facebook profile. 56%, Michael. Okay. Um, backside of this is blank, so you can use this with, um, with your young people, with parents, caregivers, with church leaders to have a conversation about some of the things that are going on, okay? Um, surprises, please. Any surprises? Facebook? The prevalence still of Facebook? Yep. Uh, Michael thought they were ex exiting Facebook. They are, but not in the huge numbers, that, at least not yet. It's still right now the currency. By and large, social currency. Nice. Meg says the video posting at 24% is it is on the rise. There's no question. But part of it is the ability. Um, so it's the networking ability and the quickness of their access. So if they can't access this quickly, if they can't upload quickly, they're just not going to do it. There's some fascinating pieces on Frontline on this generation like about their impatience with this. That as long, if it takes too long, they are just out of it. This is just, oh, this is so slow. Uh, it's running about two and a half seconds. If it takes, if it's two and a half seconds, oh my gosh, this is so slow. And yeah, so the issues of patience. Anything else you wanna say as surprises that you saw? Birthday. birthday, did they post their real birthday? Ah, uh, good point. And they, yeah, some have to in order to get on to a Facebook account, et cetera. It's unnerving. Um, Frontline is unnerved at how many young people are posting real information about themselves and not aware of what that does and the possibilities. Please. Of course, of course. Well done, Mom. Thank you. Denise says she thought there'd be a higher percentage of young people who have their personal smartphones, or at least that's what Denise's son uses as an argument for why he should have a smartphone. Well done, well done. You can say, sweetheart, I just was at this conference and then 37% only. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So you're in the majority. Yeah, everybody has. Thank you, mom. If you were a good parent, thank you very much. Any other surprises? Okay, so then you and I, I want to frame this theologically for you and for me. Um, you and I, as theologians, as uh, people of the church, um, have to talk about this in terms of our outlook. Um, and so I want to do a theological context for you and for me about this conversation about youth ministry and technology. Um, out loud with me, please. For though I am free with respect to all, I have made myself a slave to all so that I might win more of them. For the Jews, I became as a Jew in order to win Jews. To those under the law, I became as one under the law, though I myself am not under the law so that I might win those under the law. To those outside the law, I became as one outside the law, though I am not free from God's law, but am under Christ's law, so that I might win those outside the law. To the weak, I became weak, so that I might win the weak. I have become all things to all people, that I might by all means save some. I do it all for the sake of the gospel, so that I may share in its blessings. At your tables, discuss, please. Um, how does Paul's letter to the church at Corinth set the theological context for our conversation about youth ministry and technology? How does this, these verses set a theological context for our conversation about youth ministry and technology? Have a conversation quickly at your tables.
Okay, let me call you back. So obviously this is the Apostle Paul writing, and he's writing uh, to the church in Corinth. I love the church in Corinth. Ephesus, not so much, but Corinth I love. Uh, Philippi, yeah, yeah. But um, the Corinthians, these are, people, these are church people that I know. I've served this church, okay? Um, what are some major issues of the church in Corinth? Come on, biblical scholars. What are some major issues of the church in Corinth? Uh, please? Sexual immorality. Thank you, Kelsey. Well said. Thank you. Yes, sir. Class conflict. Thank you very much. What else? Ah, nicely done, Reverend. Conflict between camps, Elsa says. Yes. Anything else? Gender issues. Thank you very much. Okay. And to who, whom are you going to subscribe? Paul, Apollos, etc. I mean, all these conversations are going back and forth. And so then he ends up saying, for though I am free, Paul the Apostle is writing, with respect to all, I have made myself a slave to all so that I might win more of them. For the Jews, I became as a Jew in order to win Jews, which is fascinating because Paul is a Jew, okay? Um, to those under the law, I became as one under the law. Um, scholars aren't sure this reference, but they're thinking perhaps it is um, Gentiles who have decided to subscribe or convert to Jewish ways, and they're still under the law, although he says, though I myself am not under the law, so it's a difference from him, um, so that I might win those under the law. To those outside the law, I became as one outside the law. Who's outside the law? Husky fans, nicely done, okay? <laughs> um, and though I am not free from God's law, but I'm under Christ's law, so that I might win those outside the law. To the weak, I became weak, so that I might win the weak. I become all things to all people, bless you that I might by all means save some. So, what's the point? What is the theological context that scripture gives us for this conversation about youth ministry and technology? Meet people where they are. Lovely, Michael. So the reverend says that that's actually a, a key educational idea. You meet not where you want them to be or where they're supposed to be, you meet them where they are. And so if the reality is, based upon Frontline and the data we just looked at, significant numbers of young people are involved in technology on a daily basis, then that's part of our call, right? To meet them where they are, as Paul did. Other things that you want to say about theological context for our life in youth ministry and technology from the letter to the first Corinthians. Ooh, wow, say it again, please. Oh, interesting, lovely. Um, well, so on the one hand, God's going to be there because God is God, right? Thank you. But the vehicle, right, for us to communicate as pastors, church educators, youth leaders, etc., as people who are supposed to be sharing the gospel in some way, which is Paul's call, that's the call. You're exactly right. Well done. Anything else you want to say? Yeah, nicely done. Nicely done. Meg's comment. So, then what's your response to Meg's? That's a great comment, Meg. What's your response? Ah, uh, lovely. Which demands a relationship. So, in order to find out who these people are, you have to be in relationship with them. Well done. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay? Um, then, uh, so I'm going to cite two sources, mostly, um, interestingly, both Yale University Press. So I was, thinking, I was telling Skip last night, oh, hey, yeah, both in this town. Um, it's complicated, the social lives of network teens, uh, printed, uh, available on Kindle right now, and printed this year, 2014. Um, and the app generation, um, New Haven, also University, Yale University Press, printed, released October of last year. So these are my two major sources for this conversation. Anybody read these books yet? Have a chance to look at them yet? Um, my students are reading um, It's Complicated Social Lives of Network Teens um, in one of my classes, all right? So, um, here we go. 
teens are passionate about finding their place in society. What is different as a result of social media is that teens' perennial desire for social connection and autonomy is now being expressed in networked publics. Teens engage with networked publics because they want to be part of a broader world by connecting with people and having the freedom of mobility. Um, the phrase networked publics is a new emergence in conversation about communities. That um, these are public communities and they're networked. That is, they're all intricately related to one another. Um, they are passionate about finding their place in society. That's not new, okay? What is different as a result of social media is that teens perennially desire for social connection and autonomy is now being expressed in a different place in these networked publics, online through technology. That's different. Elsa, please. Ah, lovely question. So if, that, if they're passionate about finding their place in society, oh, Elsa asks, where, <laughs> thank you, where were they finding this before? Um, uh, if they're passionate about finding their place in society, then where did they, how did they find their place in society before technology? Bathroom wall. Uh, Meg says bathroom wall. Maybe in your neighborhood. Interesting. <laughs> Where they find these? Where they find these places for this, this passionate idea of their place in society? Please, teams. teams well done. Please, community. community centers. Well done. Churches, schools, scouts, other organizations, etc. All of whom that you've named, interestingly enough, except for schools, are declining in membership and attendance right now. Campfire, Boy Scouts, Girl Scouts, etc., boys clubs, girls clubs, they're all struggling for membership right now, interestingly enough, okay? Partly because um, the, we have enacted a whole series of laws in the country, and this is cited and it's complicated. We've enacted deliberately a whole series of laws in this country to prevent young people from gathering. Why? In public spaces, why? Be, well, because we're afraid of them. Actually, more often than not, the argument from Dana Boyd is, Dr. Boyd is, the, pu the public is at liability issues and the public is afraid for them. So we have more curfew laws for adolescents in the United States than we ever had before. We have malls where they used to gather where they're restricted as to how many of them can be in a mall at a certain time and they have to have an adult with them. There are now these multiplexes for cinemas, et cetera, that are restricting how many adolescents can go into a particular movie and watch a movie because they don't want them to gather in such huge numbers. The argument being made is they are desperate for connection, but we have systematically, what? Eliminated possibilities for their connection because we're afraid for them. And in some cases, Charlie's right, we're afraid of them as well, okay? So, if that's the case, then we force them into these network publics, which is a fascinating, fascinating argument. Um, teens engage with network publics because they want to be part of a broader world by connecting with people and having the freedom of mobility. That's not new. But a lot of our parents and caregivers are saying, don't go out, you can't go, et cetera, because I'm afraid what's going to happen to you. Therefore, the whole rise of technology as a means for connection. Uh, further, social media services like Facebook and Twitter are providing teens with new opportunities to participate in public life, and this, more than anything else, is what concerns many anxious adults. What is different, four major things. What is different, these characteristics of persistence, visibility, spreadability, and searchability. The difference is these four characteristics, persistence, the durability of online expressions and content Visibility, the potential audience who can bear witness. Spreadability, the ease with which content can be shared. And searchability, the ability to find content. That's all different in these networked publics, right? So, some key conversation points. Are teens addicted to technology? At least um, the authors of these two texts argue some, yes, but most teens are not compelled by gadgets as they are by friendship, a yearning to connect with others, and the yearning to connect with others and be seen. Most of those who appear, quote, unquote, addicted 
to their phones or computers are actually focused on staying connected to friends in a culture where getting together in person is highly constrained. Please. Yes. Nice. Nice. So the um, conversation is, Denise is on it. So Denise says, um, a lot of young people say they don't want to go to worship. And so the conversation was, well, how about if we set aside a place for you guys to sit and be in worship together? Would that meet this need? So you know God has a great sense of humor, right? You know this. Because at about 11, 12, 13, God says to young people, most young people, shift your primary allegiance from whom? From parents to whom? Peers, Peers right? That's what God says, okay? <laughs> at the same time, God says to parents and caregivers of 11 and 12 and 13 year olds, this is a really scary time. You have to hold on, okay? So parents are going, hold on, hold on. Kids are going, get away, get away. And God's going, this is so much fun. Okay? When you die and go to heaven, you can say, well, what was up, what was up with that, Lord? That was a bad plan. Okay? But at least right now, God's entertained. Okay? Some of us know 40-year-olds who haven't made that shift, and it's not pretty. Okay? You're supposed to begin to shift from your primary allegiance, being caregivers and parents, to, to peers at a certain point. They're yearning for that. Why don't we then help that happen? That's what I think a lot of technology is trying to do, actually. Please. Yes. Oh, it's a great question. So the question is, if they're yearning to be connected, but when they are together, they're still on their phones. And I've been in youth group where I've got young people who are texting each other side by side. Okay? Um, actually, the research is fascinating about this. They're still yearning to be connected. Why are they sitting together texting side by side? Right. Right. Part of it is privacy issues, that they want the conversation to take place without you having to hear. Some others are saying, in the research it's fascinating, it allows them to actually think and reflect on this without having to, oh no, respond right away. It gives some young people a chance to actually be reflective and to think about it. Now, I will say, at Central Presbyterian Church, where I worship and lead a youth ministry um, group as a volunteer, um, we walk into the youth room, and everybody knows, and adults are the same way, we're putting our cell phones into a box. We just do, we just do that during the, during the youth ministry period, um, unless there's something, an emergency is going on, and, and a young person tells us this. And that's just part of the process. So we're, we do create opportunities for actual human conversation and discourage it. Okay? Um, so... They aren't as addicted to technology, that's the argument. What they're addicted to is relationships, belonging to one another. Why do teens need to display everything to everyone? The vast majority of teens value their privacy. True, it really is true. The data is very clear. The problem is in their brain development. Most teens construct an imagined audience based on their good friends and those they themselves are following or who they have friended. They are largely unaware of who else is watching and observing, let alone forwarding their words or images. So time and again in the data, when they find out that somebody else knows something about them, and even though they, could, they friended them a year and a half ago, they don't, they're not in regular contact with them, they tend to be shocked. Like, how'd you know that? Well, I read it on your Facebook account. You did? <laughs> And it's largely because of their brain development. We know, um, right up here, put it right up here. Go, put your hands right up here. This is called your frontal lobe, right? And we know that this develops more slowly than we thought it did. We thought, you know, years ago, we thought by 15, 16, it was all there. One of the major issues and abilities here is um, predictive reasoning. If I do this, then this might happen. If I do this, then this might happen. We know that actually is delayed delayed longer, no surprise to women in the room, for men than it is for women, okay? We're thinking like 27, 28 years old by the time and, you know, when you're in seminary. Um, and then that you're thinking, that, oh, if I do this, this might happen, et cetera. Women, it happens earlier, 24, 25, we're thinking, by and large. But by and large, most teens, they're shocked 
They're surprised. Even some of the sexting that goes on, which is what? Sending graphic pictures of yourself, yes, when you're naked, thank you, as opposed to naked, okay? I, I, I wasn't born in the South, duh, look at me, but um, I, I live in Atlanta, okay? Naked is when you have no clothes on. Naked is when you have no clothes on it and you're up to something bad, okay? <laughs> So, um, uh, so uh, yeah, so when, uh, uh, you know, I love him, I love her, et cetera, I'm going to show a body part of myself, and they are shocked that what? Suddenly it goes everywhere, and they're just shocked. And we think that's because they don't intend it to happen, they just can't predict it, because their frontal lobe isn't engaging yet. As much as you hit it, it's not going to engage for them yet, okay? So the whole idea is they really do value their privacy. They just can't predict this actually is going to happen. Um, why do teens lie so much online? Uh, many teens post fictitious information about themselves and their activities online and in their profiles. For most, this is not so much about deception as it is a simple way to provide entertaining signals to friends who actually know them while refusing to play by the rules of self-presentation as defined by these sites. Some actually lie as a form of protest and a way to protect their actual privacy. In follow-up conversations, um, in both of these texts, when they asked young people, well, why did you say you got drunk when you didn't get drunk? The answer was, well, my friends who know me know what? No, I didn't get drunk. But then my parents saw him, and, and they lost it. And then this whole conflict ensued, and they're like, and they were hurt that their parents actually believed what they themselves posted <laughs> on their Facebook, okay? Does that make sense? Like, they're like, yeah, but you know me. You know I wouldn't do that. Well, then why did you write it? Because I thought it would be funny, okay? You see the logic? I mean, the logic is fascinating. Go, Meg. Yes, yes. Yes. Right. Ooh. Right. Nice. Um, makes comment that there is some research that's showing that the person's virtual selves. Um, are constructed and are as real to some of them as their real selves. Um, it, that's being contested, yes and no. Because um, we're, we're trying to push, do you, really real, do you really think this is actually real? And the answer always is no, they get it. But, some, but the identity stuff is huge because you know this, right? The adolescent task is to test out identity issues, trying to figure out who am I really. And the adolescent task of identity is um, integrity. Identity is one thing about, so the, your, your self has to be the same self when you're at school, when you're with your girlfriend, when you're at home, when you're at church, et cetera. When you reach that point of integrity where your selfhood is commensurate across all the different realms or publics of your life, then you have identity, right? Um, for good or for ill, could be a bad identity, but you still have it. It's, it's, there's integrity to that across the board. Um, Young adults we know are trying out different identities along the way. That's part of their job. Uh, I'm second of four boys. Youngest one is Brandon um, for a variety of reasons. It's part of our job. My oldest brother, Jason, myself, we just, you know, told him over and over again he was, you know, a mistake. And uh, on the doorstep we found him. We even made, we even made a note um, and um, <laughs> burned the edges with, you know, <laughs> And we use soy sauce, it's an, it's an ethnic thing, to darken the paper. And we said, please take care of my son. And we said, see? <laughs> this came with, no, it didn't. This came with you. Yes, it did. See? You're not one of us. Okay? Of course, the huge mistake is he was like 11 at the time. Um, and, you know, he's gone through therapy. But, uh, but yeah, um, <laughs> huge mistake is he, go, he yells, what does he yell? Mom. Mom, which is totally unfair. Okay? Anyway. Um, uh, when um, I was at college and I came home, um, the Seattle School District, which is where we were living at the time, went through a desegregation process. And so they took all the Asian, African-American, Latino kids from the center of the city of Seattle and we, they bust us out, which is not atypical of a lot of um, integration, sort of desegregation patterns. 
Um, so Brandon ends up in a white school in North Seattle. Well, he's never done this before and never been with like all these white people. And so he decides he's gonna be preppy. He tries to be white as possible. And so he changes his name from Brandon to Randy. Um, he, wear, he gets a um, Lacoste shirt. He wears it with the collar up. This is so pitiful. Um, and, and we're I'm like, what? what is your problem? And he, so he's like, for a week and a half, he tried to be white. It didn't work out. Duh. Okay. Um, there was a small Samoan contingent at Ingram High School in North Seattle. And Brandon um, tried to be Samoan. The problem is, he is like half my width. Okay. And um, Samoan people, by and large, are big, strong, beautiful people. And Brandon was like, you know, a string bean. Um, but to his credit, he did, for a week and a half, wear a wrap. Um, I thought, dang, you're brave. You're stupid, but you're brave. <laughs> what I was most impressed with was my parents, each, each time they were like, no, this is Randy now. I'm like, no, that's Brandon. <laughs> oh, his, his name is now Manu, he just told us. <laughs> no, that's Brandon. My parents, who I, were just tired by then, but they also, <laughs> they entertained his identity struggles each step of the way. Um, we're seeing a lot of that happen actually online now. They're trying out different identities to try to figure out what is, who, is, who are they and what will fit best, integrity-wise, across the different publics. Um, what about privacy and confidentiality? Parents and caregivers should have all passwords, but they should also balance that access with some respect for their teen's privacy. Most teens in the data respect their parents' concern and desire to protect them but in return, they expect to be trusted unless there is reason to be concerned. What's fascinating is um, over and over in the interviews that these texts have been revealing, young people will say, yeah, I, I get that they want to have my passwords, but I expect them not to use them unless they have good reason to do it. They respect that there may be good reason to do it. Does that make sense? Okay, so yes, have all the passwords. So there are a couple of handouts on the table um, that I've uh, picked up that I think are worthwhile. One is um, for parents um, in terms of well, how they should behave in the home. That's the green sheet. Um, and the, the sort of beige sheet is what you do with Facebook in particular. So those are just handouts available to you. And it's, this comes from online stuff that I think is reputable and very helpful. What about sexual predators? Many news stories and campaigns about sexual predators online are grossly misleading. Many persons quote a study issued in 2000 by the Crimes Against Children Research Center that found that one in five children minors are sexually solicited online. That's, this is a fine organization, Crimes Against Children Research Center. It's really, really, very fine. But as soon as that statistic came out that one in five children are sexually solicited online, then sh boy, people just, ah! And then other um, shows, uh, I think NBC has a, um, uh, had a series to catch a predator, et cetera. And we hear about these things and suddenly we think, oh, there are all these old men who are preying upon young women and young boys and this is just terrifying. Um, when you read and look at more of the data, further examination study revealed that sexual solicitation was defined as inclusive of everything from flirting to sexual harassment. Only 4% of solicitations came from persons over 25 years old, whereas 76% came from other minors and the rest from persons 18 to 24 years old. Further, 70% of solicitations involved no attempt at offline contact. There are sexual predators online, there's no question, but the numbers are much less than we are being led to believe because of salacious reporting and we're terrified about that. Um, Sadly, the young women and young men who do meet up with some of these individuals who only intend harm for them are young people who are already acting out in a variety of ways. They're not surprised. They're yearning for some kind of a connection and sadly, this is a way for them to get it. Does that make sense? Hands down, when we find people, young people who have succumbed to this predatory behavior, they were already acting out in significant ways. Uh, what about bullying? It is true that bullying does happen online, but not every act of teasing or aggression is bullying. What I'm really worried about now, I tell my students this, is golly, every act seems to be bullying nowadays, and it's losing any traction 
in the conversation because every act is bullying, which is not true. Um, while there is no universal agreement on what constitutes bullying, most definitions cite acts of aggression that are persistent and repetitive and involve an imbalance of power. They're persistent, they're repetitive, and they involve an imbalance of power. There's no question that bullying is happening, and most of our elementary schools, private and public, and a lot of our um, homeschooled children are going through a bullying curriculum. So their heightened awareness is extraordinary, okay? But a lot of adolescents are dismissing this idea of bullying because they think everybody's calling bullying everything, and it's not. Um, what a lot of adolescents say is the speed and coverage of network publics does make bullying more possible and dangerous. But while many adults use bullying to mean every form of youth meanness and cruelty, teenagers use the term much more conservatively. The spreading of gossip and rumors has been cited in several instances of teen depression, aggression, and attempted and completed suicide, sadly. But many teens describe this as drama more than bullying. It's not all bullying. They're actually more discriminating than we are as adults. Um, what about bullying? The more pressing issue for adolescents and youth ministry in particular is how we address what seems to be a pervasive culture of meanness and cruelty among adolescents. That's the challenge for you and for me. A lot of meanness, a lot of cruelty, not necessarily bullying, and we have to deal with it, and we have to help our young people understand how to deal with it and how to stop perpetuating it among themselves. Uh, one of my worst traits as a teacher and as a youth leader is I, I can be really sarcastic and I have fun because some of my adolescents just open themselves up and I've got to walk through that door. I mean, that's why they open the door. I've just got to walk through it, okay? If anything I regret in my life is that I have been sarcastic at times and I've looked and I could see in their eyes that they were cut to the core by my little sarcastic comment. Further, what I was teaching them was, you know, in the kingdom of God, in the reign of God, the best response with people who love Jesus and love each other is to be caustic and sarcastic with each other. And so I have worked hard and I'm working hard every day to stop, stop that. Um, in my classrooms and in my ministry and working with young people and their parents. The problem is young people are sarcastic with each other all the time. And we've got to watch that. So this whole culture of meanness and cruelty, you and I have to be able to change that among ourselves as well. Uh, what about benefits of social media and technology? In his important work, Youth Gospel and Liberation, Michael Warren called upon the church to help young people to be not only consumers of culture, but actually creators of culture. Uh, he says, um, if all we do is try help young people view culture and critique it, then we've missed a major opportunity, and that is to help young people realize they can create the culture. Part of what media technology is doing is they're creating amazing, amazing aspects of culture in and of themselves. So this is a... Um, a commercial that Apple ran at Christmas time, and the, the cut line, the title for the commercial is The Misunderstood Teenager. And perhaps you've seen this. Bow and have 
Here's a kid who it looks like during the course of the entire Christmas celebration, he what? He's disengaged. He's on his phone the entire time. He's not a participant. Oh, these teenagers. Oh, golly. What do you do with them? Only to discover that the entire time he's been recording and creating. And so on Christmas morning, he stops all the family and he shows them what he has created as a memory of a Harris family Christmas, okay? Um, media and technology are allowing our young people to lead us in some extraordinary ways. Um, so, do you know what these are by any chance? Have you, do you know these? Oh, golly, you're so good. You're also really, really white. So yeah, very good. Um, uh, these are pierogies, and I'd never had them before. I was preaching at the ordination service of one of my former students in Poland, Ohio. Uh, at the First Presbyt I know, First Presbyterian Church, um, the Reverend Kristen Strobel is amazing, and she is serving the First Presbyterian Church of Poland, Ohio. Well, I never had progies in my life, okay? Um, so after the ordination service, um, and this is a country church about uh, almost two hours outside of Pittsburgh into Ohio, um, uh, the church put together an amazing covered dish supper, right? It's just phenomenal. And they made me and Kristen and her parents were there and we, have a, we don't have a bishop, we have sort of an executive in charge of that region. And they, he, he was there and they made us go first and we come up on these three plates, okay? And I don't know what these are, right? And so I stop and I lean over and say, Kristen, what are these? And she goes, oh, Roger, they're pierogies. Okay, what are pierogies? And she translates and says, well, you know, there's like for you people, they're like gyoza or mandu or egg rolls. Okay, fine, I get it, thank you very much. Um, so it's dough with something in it, right? And so I take from the first dish, right? Um, bam, as soon as I do, I'm ready to move on. There are three plates. As soon as I do that, there is this lady who is right on my hip. And she says to me, what? Excuse me, Pastor, you didn't take mine. Mine is the third dish. It's better than the one you just took. Okay. And so I'm like, oh, okay. So I take uh, one from the third dish. As soon as I do that, Bam! There's a woman right here. And she says what? Excuse me, Pastor, you didn't take the middle one. Those, those are better than the ones you just took on the first and the third one. I'm great at this. I'm like, okay, thank you. So I had three pierogies, okay? I will tell you, they're sort of gut bombs. I mean, they're, sort of like they, they, like they, they're in there. They sit there, okay, right? So I'm leaving um, to get driven back to Pittsburgh by uh, one of the members of the church, which is very kind because it's a four-hour round trip for this poor guy to get me to the airport so I can catch the last flight out Sunday evening to Atlanta so I can teach the next morning, right, at Columbia Seminary. Um, as I'm going out to the car and say goodbye to Kristen and her family, it was just a wonderful, wonderful day, a woman comes up with a plate of not progies and all the other food. I mean, it's, I love this. Country churches, I grew up with a small church in Seattle, Japanese church, I love this. Foil over it and bag in the whole thing, and she gives it to me and says, this is for you to take home, okay? Kristen says, Roger, you want to take that back to Atlanta? And I said, Kristen, this is my dinner. I'm taking this home and eating it on the plane. He goes, okay. I get to the Pittsburgh airport. Um, uh, you know, it's late, late flights are going out. Um, and I uh, put my rollerboard, my backpack, and then I get a gray bin and I put the plate in there and I throw it in, you know, to the um, uh, machine. I go through, I get cleared. On the side, my rollerboard comes out, fine. My backpack comes out and no gray bin, okay? And so I'm standing there waiting, thinking, all right, is that, I gotta get this flight. This is the last flight out. I gotta get this back to school so I can teach in the morning. No bin. And I can see the woman, African-American woman, lovely in that bright blue shirt, and she's looking at the screen. And I can see what she's looking at, and it's sort of a blob, just a gray blob. And I think it's because of the foil, okay? And so finally, and there's nobody else around. I'm, there are other agents, but you know, not people, because it's not very crowded right now. She turns around and says, excuse me, sir, what is that? <laughs> and I said, it's a plate of church food from First Presbyterian Church, Poland, Ohio. And it has this foil over it, which is probably why, and she goes, that's probably what it is. And she goes, okay. And then she said, it's church food? And I said, yes, ma'am. I just came from a Presbyterian Church dinner, and it's church food. And she says, I'll buy it from you. 
And I said, no, ma'am, that's my dinner on the flight back to Atlanta. And then this woman, who I should have reported for this, has the nerve to say to me, you're a church person? And I said, well, yes, ma'am. She goes, well, didn't the Lord say something about sharing? And I'm like, the Lord never talked about sharing church food from Poland, Ohio. And she smiles and says, okay. And it comes through, okay? I get it that we are in a technological age. No question. To the Jews, we became as a Jew. Under the law, under the law. Someone outside the law, someone outside the law. That's our job. But commensurate with this high tech is high touch, right? People are desperate for a connection. A plate of church food from a congregation in the middle of Ohio suddenly gets the attention of a TSA agent at the Pittsburgh International Airport, okay? So I wanna show you two um, commercials. These are the most remembered commercials from the Super Bowl. Not liked, not disliked, not even successful, but the um, ad week quizzes people after the Super Bowl and says, what commercial do you remember? This is number one and this is number two. Well, you only need the light when it's burning low Only miss the sun when it starts to snow Only know you love her when you let her go Only know you've been high when you're feeling low Only hate the road when you're missing home Only know you love her when you let her go And you let her go Sponsor of Moms. Okay, so why, why is that number one and number two? Why? Relationships. And the awe factor, exactly. What's fascinating to me is, what did the first commercial advertise? Beer. What was, what was the second commercial advertise? Consumer products. And in both commercials, what? You, you didn't see them. You didn't see them. But they're the most remembered. Now, Adwee did ask, who was the advertiser? 
and discovered that the first commercial was much more successful because there's sort of a, a trajectory of the story about this horse and all that kind of stuff. They said Budweiser. But they didn't remember Procter, uh, Procter & Gamble, which is fascinating. But they remembered the commercial, OK? Youth ministry and technology. We are in a high-tech age. I appreciate so much Skip's words exactly, the Reverend Mossbach exactly, Dr. Mossbach, he's right. We are in a high-tech age. There's no such thing as high-tech. It's standard tech. But commensurate with high-tech comes high-touch. Come on, church. We were built for this. We were created for this. This is what the Lord has called us to do. We can do high touch. We can make pierogies. We can give people a chance to realize in the midst of technology that there is a Savior who loves you so much that he died for you. And we are doing our very best to embody him in our lives every single day. We were built for this. That's exactly who we are. So commensurate with high tech is this high touch age. Um, you, you know this, right? People are valuing um, home baked goods. They're valuing homemade uh, shawls and knitted things and canned foods. I mean, it's an amazing, amazing time. We were built for this, O oh, Church of Jesus Christ. That's exactly what we're here for in this day and age when people are yearning for a sense of connection. So, grateful for your time and for a chance to be in conversation with you about uh, youth ministry and technology. Um, a, you. Yep, you're on. Roger is always amazing. Oh. Roger, thank you. What a gift to the church and the youth ministry. And we've got our sermon for Sunday. We just got to clip off the last five minutes, <laughs> blow it up to fit. Done. We want to keep covenant with you. We we're do. grateful for your time. We're grateful for what you do with the young people. So we're going to break so that people can go without feeling that they're having to tear themselves away or slip away. Please take food with you, coffee with you, desserts with you. And then after a couple of minutes so that you can go if you need to, we'll come back and we'll have a couple of moments of question and answer if some folks have some questions for Roger. Thank you for coming today. Roger Michel could train the world. I mean, it would get probably more interesting.